Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of our attendees joining us today for this latest Data Science Center webinar. Uh, this is Bill Voorhees, your host. I'm the Editorial Director with Data Science Central and also Chief Data Scientist for Data Magnum. I'd like to start off our event today by thanking Tableau for sponsoring today's event. Tableau is a longtime supporter of the Data Science Center community, and we're honored to have them sponsoring our event today. I'd also like to take this opportunity to mention and show our appreciation for some of our other recent sponsors, including Alteryx, Microsoft, Exaptive, Pivotal, IBM, and Hortonworks, to name just a few. Now, our past webinars are available on demand at datasciencecentral.com. And if you hadn't had an opportunity to uh, view them, I encourage you to take a look. They provide some very useful insight into a wide variety of topics of interest to our data science community. Today's webinar is entitled, The Neuroscience of Storytelling. And before we begin, I'd like to briefly review the format for today's webinar. Today's event will be uh, an hour long. Uh, we have one presenter that I'll introduce in just a minute. There'll be 10 to 15 minutes of Q&A following the presentation. Uh, and this event is being recorded and will be available on datasciencecentral.com later this afternoon following today's live event. You know, I'd also like to encourage our attendees to provide questions throughout the presentation. Uh, we'll be reviewing and presenting them on your behalf during the Q&A portion of today's event. So I'm very pleased to introduce today's speaker, Rawi Nanakul, with Tableau. Rawi has been storytelling for over 10 years using photography, ethnography, filmmaking, and neuroimaging. Rawi holds degrees in music and psychology and investigated how brains associate memory with music. His master's degree in Fulbright scholarship was focused on the visual ethnography of Thailand, which involved examining the lives of Thai kickboxers in Thailand through film and photography. As a neuroimaging researcher, uh, he's used EEG and MRI to investigate a variety of topics, including fragile X syndrome, dementia, autism, and music neuroscience. So thanks for being with us today, Rowie. We're looking forward to your presentation. Now, whether you told through words, images, or sounds, a good story creates physiological responses in our brains and bodies, from unforgettable memories to overwhelming tears. In today's Data Science Central webinar, we'll examine the neuroscience principles of vision, memory, and attention in storytelling. Uh, we'll be reviewing the scientific data and drawing examples from film, oral storytelling, and tableau to leave attendees with a deeper understanding of the brain and the stories it forms every day. So, Ryan, with that, I'm going to turn it over to you. You can begin as soon as you're ready to go. Thank you so much, Bill, for that introduction. Good morning good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rowie Nonical. I'm a senior product consultant with Tableau Software. I've been here for about three years. In addition to being at Tableau, like Bill mentioned, I'm also a filmmaker and photographer. Uh, if you guys want to check out my Twitter, I'm at Beer Art Life. Feel free to tweet me at any time. So let's talk about who I am a little bit first. Bill gave me a great introduction, but you guys probably want to know some of the fun stuff. So I've done music neuroscientist, uh, sorry, music neuroscience. I've done uh, neuroimaging with Fragile X and autism. Uh, I've also done dementia research with Alzheimer's. Uh, and I've also done Thai kickboxing. And just to prove that to you, let's go ahead and take a look at one of my photographs. All right, this was actually part of my master's thesis. I uh, fought in a dive bar in northern Thailand, uh, and I won 50 bucks. Uh, I can tell you uh, it w I would rather have done this than done a thesis defense. So I'm OK with my decisions. Uh, in addition, I'm also a professional photographer in beer. And I photograph for craft breweries uh, and non-craft breweries all over the country. And the reason why I mention this to you is that with you're going to see a lot of ties of photography uh, and storytelling and visual analysis. Right? So at Tableau, uh, I help customers create dashboards uh, that are memorable. We create stories from our data that are memorable. And I'm going to take my unique experiences of being both on the data science side and also on the ethnography and photography side uh, and combine them together. And we'll also talk about the neuroscience. That's, that's going to be the big topic today. So we're going to combine all three fields together. All right. 
So the main theme of today, and if you walk away with nothing else, is to tell memorable stories. We create and interpret and experience stories every day. Whether, regard, whether you realize it or not, you are creating a story in front of you. You, know, you are looking at this slide, uh, listening, you're listening to me speak, and trying to figure out why the heck should I stay on this webinar. It, the great stories, though, are the ones that we remember. Right? The ones that we can walk away, tell our buddies at a bar, uh, tell our significant others when we get home. Those are the truly special ones. Right? In today's seminar, we're going to take neuroscience and how we interpret the world around us and combine it with some uh, design uh, and, sorry, not design, some principles of neuroscience and also the principles of uh, we'll look at some photography, we'll look at some audio, and we'll also look at movies. I'm not going to make you the, the next George Lucas, uh, but at least your partner when you get home will be a little bit more entertained by your stories. So the first thing we're going to talk about is neuroscience and pop culture. Uh, as a former neuroscientist, uh, I look at the world around me and I feel like neuro the word neuroscience has been bastardized and if you sprinkle it on something, it automatically gives you some credibility. Uh, I'm guilty of that because I called this talk the neuroscience of storytelling and it probably piqued your interest a little bit. This popularization is all around us. Uh, I don't know if anybody watches brain games, but we have television shows that show all the tricks uh, of our brain. I don't know if anyone notices uh, what's wrong uh, with that card in his hand. We have apps and video games that promise to uh, reclaim your brain, to uh, make your brain a, a younger age, or to uh, bring back some of your memory. Uh, we have TV shows like House MD uh, that suddenly show you a brain scan of music. If anybody remembers this episode, uh, Dave Matthews, the musician, is in a tube and they're scanning him while he's playing music. I actually worked on a study uh, very close to this, and if, if anyone's actually done fMRI, uh, things don't light up on the screen for you live. Uh, it takes a giant computer cluster and hours and days of statistical processing, and you get a, a couple of pixels on a map and say, hey, I can write a, a paper on that. Right? So misinterpretation of uh, some of the things we can do in medicine. Uh, and even Pixar has jumped on the bandwagon of neuroscience and emotions. I actually have no problem with this. I, I love this movie. So if you guys uh, like Pixar movies, I definitely recommend it. So what is neuroscience? Right, so I've kind of talked about how it's been skewed and you know, misused. But neuroscience is actually the study of the peripheral system and the brain. So anything that has to do with the nervous system and the brain and the body. This can extend from uh, the nerves in your pinky all the way to how you decide whether or not uh, you would like to take a shower today. Right? Uh, the decision processing, the uh, emotional interpretation of, of whether or not you want to do something. And we have a number of fields uh, that are grown out of neuroscience as a result. Uh, we have neuroimaging, which is the study of the of actually imaging the brain. So this could be done through fMRI and EEG. EEG is studying the electrical activity from the scalp. Uh, fMRI is looking at the blood flow. Uh, we have uh, uh, neuropsychology, uh, so looking at how the different anatomy might play a role in how we make decisions. Uh, we have cognitive neuroscience, which is a mix of neuroimaging and also uh, decision making. There's all these different fields, uh, even uh, neuroeconomics, which is a really fun field. I definitely recommend you guys look it up uh, and how we actually buy and how our, our brain dictates uh, our buying decisions in, in the stock market. Right? So neuroscience is the, is, the, is the study of our brain and our nervous system and all the things that those encompass. The most, who, so you're probably wondering, well, who bastardizes this term and who kind of makes it as fluid as, as possible? Uh, it's, it's actually academics, and I was guilty of it too. Uh, wherever grant we had going on, it's like, oh, we'll just throw the word neuroscience. If it was a neurology grant, we'd throw the word neurology. Uh, there's a lot of very fluid interpretations of all these fields. Uh, but as a result, it's a lot of fun, uh, and you can take a lot to it to your daily life.
So how many of you had the song War as soon as you read this pop into your head? Right? You were prompted and you probably thought, Whoa, what is it good for? Maybe you didn't, maybe you did. For those of you that did, what did you associate with that? Uh, was it a movie? Was it a video game? Uh, was it a moment in time? This is something called musical autobiographical memory. Right? And this is a story unto itself. It's also a memory. But what, how do we define a story? Right? So I just pointed out it's very nebulous and it's very broad. And for today's conversation, I'm going to define a story as such. A series of thoughts, sounds, images, and brought together by some unifying thread. So a story can be something as cohesive as I woke up, I went to the store, I bought a book or something as rambling as something that you come back and tell your friends after you've had a couple of beers and they look at you and think, I think you need to go home. Right? Those are all stories. But what's a good story? Right? There are two components to me that make up a good story. The first one is structure. Right? We have where we're going from, uh, where we're going, and then how did we get there? Right, A, B, C, et cetera. And we're going to take that structure and we're going to combine it with symbolism. Right? These are, so what is the significance of me telling you oh, how I went to the store or how there was a, a discovery for a cure for cancer? Right? You, you need to have this structure that allows you to process this information and understand it, but also give it meaning to yourself through symbolism. So take a minute, <clears throat> take a look at this photograph, and think about what you are seeing here. And we make sense of our world through stories. Our brains crave structure so much that even in the absence of no other information, we try to piece together as much as we can for a semblance of things. So what are you seeing right now? What are you experiencing? Uh, we take a look at this photograph. Uh, we know that it's. We see some boxing gloves. We see some children. You know, are they boxing? Are they kickboxing? Uh, earlier, I mentioned that I was in Thailand. Maybe you're thinking, oh, this is definitely in Thailand because Rowie mentioned it. Uh, your brain is constantly trying to take these pieces of the things that we know and trying to create new information from this. You know, we do this every day. When you're looking at a data set, it's like, oh, well, I I know that this is a format in this way. Uh, I know that I can do this and that from it. And we gleam new information. And this is the core of what we're going to be talking about today. Right? Is known to the unknown. Right? This is going to be the theme that I want you to think about for your data stories or whatever you, however you're telling stories in your daily life is I need to be able to relate to this other person or, or persons the information that's known to the unknown, taking established information that they can identify with and presenting something new from it. All right. Just to give you guys a little explanation on that previous image, uh, this is an image I took in northern Thailand in Chiang Mai, uh, and it's some of uh, pictures of some adolescent fighters. All right, I'm going to go ahead and just pause here for a minute and let everyone read this. All right, so it's, it's election year here in the U.S. Uh, things are a little touchy. Uh, we have new dating sites that if you want to move to Canada, you can, be a, you can find a Canadian uh, as a U.S. citizen to help you move over. So let's go ahead and take a look at the structure of that comic. All right, we have our known, which is that it's an election year, and moving to Canada. We've, we've heard that analogy before. If, if so-and-so wins, I'm getting the heck out of here. Right? So those are our two knowns. The unknown is that dying in Canada is real. You know, Canada is a real place, uh, kind of. Canada also happens to be the matrix. Right? 
that's the humor in this. This was the reason why hopefully you chuckled was, oh, I knew that it was an election year. I, I've heard this analogy of moving to Canada, and the unknown is that, oh, ca Canada happens to be a real place, and it also happens to be the matrix. So let's go ahead and break down that story structure. So we took the known to the unknown, and let's take a look at how your brain processed that. Let's go ahead and talk about your visual system. Your prefrontal cortex is the area in the front of your brain. Uh, it's responsible for executive decisions and higher brain function. Uh, earlier, we talked about the musical autobiographical memory. That also comes from your prefrontal cortex. Right? So think of that as your, your main hub for uh, all your higher functions, right? emotion, decision making, et cetera. On the back of our brain, uh, so if you want to play along here with your scalp, uh, put your finger on just the top of where your your neck is, and that's going to be our uh, the region that's associated with our, our visual system. So we have the occipital lobe, we have the parietal lobe back there as well. And that system, we're going to see that it kind of breaks out into fur further areas. Uh, but as we read in information, um, so as we take in information, if we're reading that comic, uh, it's going to hit our visual system first, and then it's going to go back to our uh, pre prefrontal cortex and give us meaning of, oh, what does that word mean? In addition, we also have Wernicke's area. Right? Wernicke's area, some of you might have heard it before. Uh, it's involved in the language processing. Uh, if you have an injury to your Wernicke's area, uh, it's very hard for you to understand uh, how to, to read something. You'll look at words and you won't be able to decipher um, that, that they are words. You'll just see a jumble of letters. And so those would be our three main functions here. And you see that the, the visuals actually play into a pretty broad areas of the brain. You know, we're, we're covering both the front and the back and, and the middle. And we're going to talk more about this and how all these items tie in together. Right? But this is your brain on visual stimuli. Now, I came from the behavioral world. Uh, when I originally did this talk, uh, this, this talk is supposed to be with my fiance, uh, who is, has a PhD in neuroscience, and she was a big molecular practitioner. I was a big behavioral. Uh, so it was a lot more fun when uh, the two of us are bickering about uh, which one is better. So this is uh, my how I would actually use this information. And we're going to talk about a visual oddball, all right, the P300. So go ahead and I'm going to play, play a little animation for you. Uh, and just, I want you to notice when something is a little bit off, all right? All right. So hopefully you saw the stick figure that threw his hands up. And what happened there was that we had the unknown, right? So we, our known was that there was a stick figure with his hands down, and then the unknown was that the stick figures had it hand up. And here we have a uh, EEG or ERP, and this is the field that I specialized in. Uh, this was actually a study that, that I ran uh, back in the day. The image here shows the very low activation, right? So this is just our standard. Like, so you're looking at something that there's nothing surprising about it. Everything's are pretty flat. Uh, that first bump that you see on the first tick mark that's uh, hitting the, that top of the line there uh, is actually called our N100. That's a pre-attentive process. Um, for those of you who have ever listened to any talk about uh, visual analytics, uh, and you've pr probably heard the term pre-attentive process, and that means that it's almost like a uh, we, we process it even before we made a decision upon it. That's what that actually looks like. So when we talk about the importance of designing things for pre-attentive processes, that's the actual waveform that your brain is exerting, and that happens about 100 milliseconds uh, after the onset of the stimulus. The more interesting here thing one here is the P300. So when we saw that stick figure, stick figure th threw our hands up, we thought, oh, this is something unexpected. Uh, what happened here? And this is what happens in our brain here is we have this huge bump, and it says, oh, so something happened. Like, what am I supposed to do with this? And the important thing here is that when we introduce something that is uh, unexpected, we need to give it a baseline. 
if we don't give it a baseline, it just becomes jumbled. I, I didn't include the waveform here, but if you just have a waveform of just uh, non-established, just random noise images, we really don't get anything. It's just kind of a wavy line. There's really nothing that we can interpret. So here, I want you guys to take away the P300 is you want to embrace the oddball. You want to have that new information, that unknown presented, but you need to make sure that unknown is presented in such a way that the end user is ready to accept it. So I always like to throw in a little bit of impress your friends. Uh, so what can you tell your friends uh, at the bars tonight about what you learned today? Uh, your brain on Tableau. Uh, includes everything from your executive portion of your brain, so that prefrontal cortex, the visual cortex, which is near the back of your brain, and language, which is in the middle, so that Wernicke's area. You want to establish a baseline before you interpret, give something new in order to make that unknown to be very impactful. Now, if I had just thrown you a bunch of stick figures in all random size uh, directions, and I said, oh, didn't you notice the one with his hands up, you probably would have said, no, I don't know what you mean. So think about how you're presenting your story and think about the end user and that did you clearly establish what you were trying to present? And more and lastly, the P300. Right? P, P stands for positive, by the way. It's a positive direction of the electrical charge. And I want you to channel your inner oddball. I want you to think about presenting that oddball in such a way that it gives the most impact. All right, let's go, go ahead now. That's, that's the visual system. Let's go ahead and move on to the audio. New York's Coney Island used to be known for sideshows featuring tattooed ladies and sword swallowers. 95 years ago, it was also known for its exhibition of tiny babies. They were premature infants kept alive in incubators that were pioneered by Dr. Martin Cooney. The medical establishment rejected the use of incubators. Dr. Cooney didn't give up, though, and each summer for 40 years, he funded his work by setting up exhibitions of his incubator babies. Parents didn't have to pay for the medical care. Many of the children survived. All right, so that was an, an audio story taken from NPR. And let's go ahead and look at that structure. All right, so the known is that we, we've some of us have probably heard about Coney Island. Uh, we imagine probably roller coasters and fun rides and hot dogs. Uh, and the unknown, the novelty of this was the incubator babies uh, and using babies as an attraction. A lot of us uh, who have had children or uh, know people who have had children uh, have probably heard of incubators and we, we kind of take them for granted. We just think, of, oh, that's, that's normal. Um, but as the story shows, um, early in its history, it was seen as a no-no. Right? So here's our known and to our unknown. That's what makes this story so interesting. So now let's go ahead and take a look at what is in the audio system. What is in the, uh, how do we process sound? So our, our old friend, executive function, uh, shows back up. Wernicke's area with language system shows back up as well because we have to interpret those, those audio uh, words, right? So the meanings behind the uh, sounds I'm making through my voice. And here's our primary audio system, uh, and this is part of Wernicke's area. There's a couple other, and Brokaw's area as well. And the main importance here is, I'm going to go ahead and show you this, this, this somatosensory and motor cortex. And the audio system actually plays with other realms. Uh, and, and today we're going to specifically talk about our tactile and motor sensations, right? Not what you expected, probably. Let's go ahead and take a look at a study here. So in this study, uh, users were given a story. And this, so this is an fMRI study, so that we're looking at the blood flow and activation in a brain. And what's happening here is that someone tell, just tells you a story. So someone s says, um, she had a tough day uh, versus she had a bad day. And they found that when the, you, they use adjectives uh, that had tactile meaning, like tough, rough, um, bright. That's not so much a tactile, but to me it is. Uh, that they found that there was more activation. So we actually activated the parts of our brain uh, that were related into tactile sensations. So if someone said the, um, 
the phone was plastic and rough and had divots in it, we actually act, they actually activated those areas in the brain. So what does that mean for us as data storytellers? It means that when we're explaining something or writing about something, that the more adjectives that we use uh, correctly now, don't overuse them, but the more that we are able to describe what we are trying to uh, bring across, the more people interpret them. So if I, th rather than just saying, oh, this, this viz is really bad, you could say, well, this viz uh, hurts my eyes because there's too much neon green. Right, so we have the sensation of hurt. Uh, we have also the neon green. It's neon green is an example of something too high contrast for eyes. And we actually see, we actually feel texture through audio commands. Um, so as like when you're reading a good book as well, um, for ho hopefully many of you, when you read a good book, you're, you're imagining that scene, right? And that's actually happening in your brain. It's not just uh, a metaphor, all right? So that's, again, that's the molecular side of the house. Let's go ahead and look at the behavioral side. And how, do I, how do I use this as a behavioral neuroscientist? So we'll talk about the N400. The N400 uh, is a, a negative charge um, at 400 milliseconds. Uh, my, my animations got a little bit messed up, uh, got switched here, but I'll show you an example. So if I present to you, uh, Luke and Leia are, you're probably thinking, hmm, what? Scatterplot? No. You expected me to probably say Luke and Leia are the greatest superheroes ever, or Luke and Leia are twin brothers, uh, etc. And when we present a story, uh, be it a data visualization or an audio story or uh, any type of story, and, the ex and we go off that expectation so far, uh, we listed something called the N400. So you can see here on, on the left with the correct, we have this nice big open waveform. Uh, I won't go into the science too much about it, but uh, that those, those big chunks in between that you see that space is our brain uh, correctly uh, processing something that is correct and incorrect. Right? So the, the baseline and the, and the stimuli in this experiment. Uh, and then on the right side of the incorrect, uh, you see very little, and you see this you see this bump here where that arrow is pointing of, of it going up, and that's the negative is up in EEG for whatever for whatever reason. It's a standard convention. But when we present stories that go wrong, we elicit an N400, and when we elicit an N400, it makes it harder for people to remember. Now, with that said, that N400 is also related to stimuli that's unexpected and that's engaging. Right? So we want to find that balance of presenting something that's new and interesting without presenting something that doesn't make any sense. Right? Uh, you want to present stories that when that unexpected thing happens, people are ready for it. Right? Let's go ahead and talk about, just to summarize this up, uh, your brain on audio uh, is a combination of the executive uh, s system of your brain, the prefrontal cortex, the auditory, which is kind of that middle part, Wernicke's and Broca's area, uh, and, and language processing. Right? When you're telling a story, use rich descriptions, uh, use metaphors, use analogies uh, for uh, people to, be to better understand what you're trying to convey, but also to actually activate those parts of the brains that you are trying to convey. And the N400, just keep that in mind as you're writing your story. Uh, of, you don't want to be a bad plot twister. You don't want to be the next uh, M. Night Shyamalan. Um, he, he, good, good couple of movies back in the day. Now, hmm, not so much. Um, so don't, don't be that guy. All right, so let's talk about movies. Uh, Star Wars is a, is a big uh, favorite of mine. Um, and hopefully you've seen it. If you haven't seen it, maybe you've just heard of Star Wars. Uh, but we'll just kind of briefly talk about films. So like you, like many of you, uh, the, the known with the new Star Wars movie was, hey, it's more Star Wars. That's super exciting. Uh, better than Star Trek? No? 
works a little bit. This joke kind of works a little bit easier if I actually got some feedback and I could hear you guys. Uh, but I'm a, a Star Trek and a Star Wars fan. Uh, and the unknown would be, are there going to be more Star Wars movies? And the the biggest one was, is Jar Jar going to be in this movie? Uh, and if you're a Star Wars fan, that was a big concern for for a lot of us. So what's in a movie? It's, what are all the different senses and parts of your brain activated in a movie? So we're going to tie all the things that we've gone through together. We have a combination of the visual system, right? We're actually seeing the images uh, in the film. The language system, because we have to process what the characters are saying. The auditory, we're processing that music. Uh, music is actually its own separate entity. Uh, if you guys want to ask me questions about music at the end, uh, feel free to. Uh, but I leave music as a separate line item because it is a very complex uh, subject. Uh, it processes differently than language. Uh, and then our somatosensory, so our, our tactile sensations and our motor functions as well. Right? So all those different aspects that we talked about earlier are combined into a movie. All right, so let's we'll talk about neurocinematics. Right? Uh, this is a field that's pretty small, and I found it really interesting as someone who is a, a filmmaker uh, as well as a photographer. Uh, on the left, we have a structured movie. So we have a, a movie that has good composition. Uh, it's, in this case, it's following the rule of thirds. It's clear that we want to look at these two characters. We can see these two characters uh, that are uh, engaged with one another and thinking, hmm, like what's about to go down. Uh, on the right, we have an unstructured movie, and there's a scene, like there's a pe person's blocking, like it's hard to interpret. So go ahead and just look at these two images um, back and forth here. And with neurocinematics, they found using an eye tracking method that when we create a scene uh, that is clear and focused, uh, we gaze in one spot. Uh, we are attentive, right? Because we, we, the name of the game here is to keep attention. When we use an unstructured movie frame, uh, like the one on the right, our eyes are all over the place. Our eyes are trying to figure out, what the heck am I supposed to be doing with this? Um, where am I supposed to be looking? What am I supposed to be understanding? You're, you're spending all of your energy trying to figure out what's going on rather than remembering and understanding what's going on. Uh, with the study, they also did some um, brain imaging. Uh, so they looked at, uh, again, they, they put people in an MRI um, and showed them a, a movie scene that was structured uh, and then a movie scene that was unstructured. And they found that in areas of the brain uh, in which there was structure, there was a higher activation. So we, we can see on the left there, uh, we have the visual cortex is being activated. And on the right, we have the uh, auditory cortex being activated. So all the different parts of the brain uh, that we mentioned earlier, with exception of the prefrontal, they didn't study in this case, they were just looking at tracking, uh, are, are being, uh, did, are being uh, elicited. Right? So in other words, what we can take from this is that when we create a scene or we create a visualization that we are presenting to others, we want to make sure that they're not spending their time looking around. We want to we make sure that it's clear uh, where they should start, uh, what they should be doing, and where they should be going. Uh, in addition, uh, when we use these particular techniques, uh, it keeps us it, it keeps us in the flow of what we're doing. Um, it, it's almost like mind control. And, uh, my, my, my fiance would would say that uh, this is mind control because we are so engrossed in what we're doing, uh, and all the parts of the brain are being activated to that story uh, that we ignore the world around us. Uh, if, if, if any of you have ever seen the classic psych experiment of uh, the ball being passed around and then asking people if you saw the gorilla, right, that's a great example of this, uh, this effect where you're so engrossed and so attentive on the story on hand uh, that you, you don't look at the world around you. Right? The story structure uh, is mind control. Uh, when we have a good structure, people are able to follow along, uh, the parts of the brain uh, that we want to be activated are activated and they just stay enriched, or they, they stay in, engaged. Um, when we have a good story, we want to give it, we want to have as much symbolism as possible in order to stimulate our, our memories and experiences of it. Now hopefully 
uh, you'll remember uh, the different Star Wars examples, the Coney Island example, uh, and uh, the Canada example uh, in this particular talk. You may not remember all the neuroanatomy I discuss, but hopefully you'll be able to remember uh, the metaphors that were used, right? the symbolism that was used. Right? And finally, uh, movies uh, or dashboards that you have to look around too much, uh, people tend to not want to look at them. You know, if they have to work too hard to understand it, uh, they're not going to remember it, they're not going to attend to it, uh, and you're going to be ignored. And the worst thing that we can do uh, as data scientists is to do all of this hard work, uh, find an amazing insight, uh, and not have anyone care, uh, and, not, and not have anyone understand, uh, because since they can't understand it, they just won't care. Right? Um, visualizations that we create, data that we, we pull out, that if it's not conveyed to another, it's not receptive to another, uh, is, is, is the greatest tragedy that we can incur upon. To kind of sum this up uh, before we go into the Tableau side of things uh, is our brains crave structure and salience. Uh, when we don't have structure, like when, when we were looking at the photograph earlier uh, of the child, uh, without any context, we start pulling things together, uh, whether we like it or not. So you want to create at least a, a, as much of a baseline structure as you can so you can skip over that initial processing and search and go right into the understanding and your interaction with the data visualization or story that you're trying to portray. Keep in mind the known to the unknown. Right? So establishing that baseline, taking that, the end user to this new and, and un, um, unexpected thing uh, will create a memorable experience. Uh, when you're designing your dashboards uh, or working with data or telling a story, think about the oddball, right? And channel the oddball, meaning, again, baseline to really set up what your message home is. And it, you want to avoid being the N400, right? Don't be that guy or girl. You want to av avoid presenting something that's so off the wall or so far from the original context uh, that people just don't understand it. And finally, we want to simulate experience. Right? This is not a, a typo. It's not supposed to say stimulate experience. This is simulate. And we want to tell stories that simulate as much as possible what we are trying to convey. So in your stories, uh, use rich adjectives. Uh, describe things tact uh, tactilely if you can. But paint as rich a picture with symbolism uh, and uh, tactile sensation as you can. Right? Simulate experience. All right. So that sums up the slides. And we're going to look at a quick glimpse in the Tableau and how I use this uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. And we're going to talk about one of the data stories that uh, I wrote. All right. So one of the things I also do, out of the many things that I've mentioned so far, is I also own a beer festival. Uh, I, being an autism researcher, it was really important for me that once I left, I was still able to give back. Uh, and I started this beer festival uh, that funds uh, grassroots efforts uh, for families with autism. Uh, so last year, we provided funding for a skateboarding charity. We funded about 100 skateboards for the year um, and, and lessons. Uh, for children with autism and special needs. All right. So here's my story. Uh, pretty common question, right? As, as, as if someone, if you're a data science expert, someone's probably going to ask you, like, well, what, what am I supposed to do with this money? Like, I spent this money. Did I make a good decision with it? And for me, it was I spent money on Facebook ads for the first time. Uh, was it worth it? Right. Uh, I found so with my story here. I go. Uh, Photos are my top performing ads. So I see here, okay, I had some good ads. Cool. There's some pictures of food. Great. R Raleigh, uh, excuse me. Um, I'm, I'm not sure the audience can see your oh. screen. Oh, I apologize. You know, that's my bad. I, uh, hold up. Thank you, Bill. The, uh, play, I forgot to hit the play button. Uh, one second, everyone. All right. Bill, is that okay now? Yes, it is. All right. One second, folks. I'm just have to 
resizes. All right. All right. So here we go. All right. Apologies. Let me start over here. Uh, did Facebook ads uh, were they worth the spend? Right. And I have some pictures of food. They were great. Uh, pictures of food uh, were so great that it drove up our sales uh, by 34% this year. It was great. Uh, if, if, you, if anyone here works online that works for Facebook, uh, it was a great impact for my company. Uh, and did post impressions affect ticket sales? Right. So kind of a mismatch of a story. Like The only thing really memorable probably for, for everyone was uh, my description in the beginning of you know, why I started the beer festival. And the it's kind of a mismatch. It's like, uh, okay, pictures of food, uh, impressions went up. I don't get this. And this is a very poorly structured story. It doesn't make any sense. Let's go ahead and take a look at a better structured story. Right? So I own a beer festival, uh, and we've been growing over time. There's a picture of it. It's in Sacramento, California. It's called The Art of Beer. And... We were able to jump up in sales uh, by 75% uh, year over year last year. And I wanted to know uh, if this was because of Facebook. Because this was the most money we've ever spent with Facebook, and we went with a digital campaign rather than a traditional print campaign. The Looking at my impressions, I noticed that there is a pretty strong relationship uh, with impressions and ticket sales. All right. Uh, did our content actually drive, did, did more Facebook exposure actually drive ticket sales? And I can see here that I have my gray is my ticket sales uh, and my blue is my total impressions. And I did a basic trend line, trend line analysis and show, hey, this is actually a pretty close relationship. It looks like it was a great decision to spend money on this. Especially when it came to pictures of food and discounts of free of free stuff, right? So this is a much, much more structured story. It took me through, okay, this is what the Spear Festival is about. This is a business question that I'm trying to present. Um, this was the uh, my approach to it, and this was the resolution. So I'll leave everyone with this on, on a basic format of how you can use Tableau um, to tell stories. And remember we, we talked about the, the known to the unknown and this is the same same format. Uh, I'm actually this is actually coming from uh, the structure of comic books, but I, I thought it was really helpful uh, to explain how we can use story points in Tableau to explain uh, to to use in our stories. So we have our establisher. So what is the situation? What is, what is establishing this story? And in this in in this case, it was hey, I own a beer festival, All right? The initial uh, is the you can think of it as the, the basic groundwork. So we, we've established what our framework is, and the initial is what are the business questions or what's the um, questions that are, are motivating this need, right? So in this case, uh, we have uh, our Facebook summary, like our, our, our page likes crew, right? And then we have the initial. Uh, we have a second initial in this case. Uh, so you can have more than one establisher or more than one initial. The difference between the establisher and the in initial is you can think of an establisher as providing just the context of what you're doing, and then the initial is the why or the idea of why you're trying to do something. All right. So establisher, initial, initial, and then we have our peak. All right. So this is the climax of our story. Right. This, this is when I presented my main findings of I did this trend analysis to show that spend was worth it. Right, so this is the height of our of our story. If you could think of it in, a, in terms of movies, this is the the climax in the movie where the the hero just defeated the bad guy. And finally, the release. Right, so what is the the resolution? What are the next steps? Um, if we're talking about hero movies, it's you know the hero going off uh, with the uh, heroine and living living happily ever after. In in my particular data story, it's okay, cool, um, I found that the money was worth it and I should spend more money on photo ads, right? So please go ahead, take this format uh, and use it. If you uh, want to look, if you want to find more about it, uh, look up, uh, it's a book called um, The Structure of Comics by Neil Cohen. Uh, and it talks more about how you can use these uh, 
these themes and these templates uh, to show stories. All right. So again, that known to the unknown. Uh, all right, Bill, um, I'll let you take it away, and uh, we'll start off with questions or whatever's next. Well, Rawi, uh, thanks for that excellent presentation. Uh, we'll get started with today's Q&A session, and I want to thank our audience uh, for their participation. We've had a, a great many questions that have come in during the presentation, and we'll do our best to get through all of them in the time remaining. So uh, during this Q&A session, I'll leave up uh, this screen with Rawi's contact information if you'd like to contact him following today's webinar. So let's get started. Um, Rawi, uh, you know, your main points uh, go from the known to the unknown and embrace the oddball. Uh, you made me immediately think also about uh, the lessons they, they tell about how to give a good uh, TED talk. Um, but can you give us some examples uh, that would illustrate for those of us that aren't neuroscientists, uh, some of the more mundane issues. I've got, for example, uh, a, a visualization that I need to present to, a, to an executive group that says, oh, uh, sales in this area are good, and, but sales in this area are bad. Uh, can, can you give an example of how uh, that might be turned into a story or how you might focus that according to the principles you've discussed? Yeah, so that's, that's actually kind of a pretty complex question. Uh, I'm going to take it from the viewpoint of the user experience. So if you're trying to present, you know, let's say the sales are good here, sales are bad there, what is, your, what is the user experience you want the users to, to have? Is it that you want them to, do you want to obfuscate the fact that things are bad in this area? Or are you trying to <laughs> highlight the fact that good, things are good in this other particular area? Um, and you can use that structure of the known to the unknown to um, mind control people into what you ultimately want them to interpret. Right? So if you want to obfuscate the fact that you embezzled a few dollars you know, from the fund, uh, you might want to hide all that visualization stuff on the bottom, right? You could take it from the viewpoint of visual, of, uh, visual design and just uh, use like a newspaper design and push it to the bottom. Uh, or you could tell a story of that kind of uh, addresses that fact, but you know, highlights it in a different way and say, oh, you know, we had some uh, weird funds go this other direction, uh, but I think that uh, this was due to something else. You know, do you want to get in front of it? So the, the known to the unknown is, can still be used, but think about what you want to convey, you know, regardless if it's, a, if it's mundane or you know, life-changing. Just think about what your end user, what you actually want to convey to the end user, and and use that structure to to mind control them into what you want to them to uh, interpret. Okay, well, that was an excellent answer, but let me probe that a little bit more uh, about uh, when you said embrace the oddball. Can you give some general advice uh, in um, building visualizations about how embracing the oddball might work? Yeah. So let's. Uh, Let's see here. Let's see if I have a visualization that I can show from. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Is that okay, Bill? If I can share my screen again? Yes. Yep. It's or, coming up. There it is. All right. So the embracing the oddball. So let's let's go ahead and, and take a look at this this worksheet here. Uh, from from the, the initial viewpoint, it's just a line chart. Right, so we can say, oh, this is my spend uh, over time. Right, we, we've all we've all pretty basic concept. And if I were just to show it like this, uh, we kind of have it's like, all right, I, it's hard for me to actually discern what is important about it. Right, so if we look at the 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 good story version, we actually have it two steps. So this is my original. So look, let's think of this as my standard, right? So we look at, if we're looking at the example of uh, the the stick figures that you know had a standard of okay, this is what our standard sales over time looks like. Well, here now is the oddball, right? I've I've taken this typical line chart and I've added a new type of analysis on it uh, that was unexpected, right? I, I've only highlighted certain points. I've done a, a basic trend line analysis. Uh, and I've taken my user from something mundane, like a line chart, uh, and added something else new to it, uh, and given the, the oddball, per se. Okay, so, terrific. 
Thanks. Uh, and uh, what about uh, some more general advice uh, to keep people focused uh, on the data that you're trying to present when you're sharing data to tell a story? Uh, from what perspective, though? Are we talking visually? Are we talking audio-wise? Oh, like well, I, I was hoping that, that uh, there was perhaps something in Tableau that would help me tell a better story. Uh, is, there, is there some structure in Tableau that, that gives me guidance in how to uh, utilize your rules? Yeah, so we have something called story points. And if I go ahead and click here on new story, uh, you can create a, a PowerPoint-like presentation, uh, but more importantly, a structured presentation. So th this is the tool, the feature that I used when I was creating my story earlier. If I go ahead and show this one. Uh, and with story points, you can write in a caption. You know, it could be a single word. It could be a full sentence. Uh, you drag in your worksheets and your dashboards. And you can create annotations uh, on the fields themselves. Uh, in order to uh, drive your story forward, right? So this is gonna this is gonna create a, a linear path in order to present to your uh, end users on how you want them to interpret the story. Oh, that really would be a help. Oh, that's uh, that's very interesting. And uh, what uh, you you mentioned uh, one book, I believe it had to do with uh, the story structure in comic books. Are there other resources uh, that the audience would like to know about? Uh, that would help us uh, utilize your your findings. Yeah, so my my favorite book um, that's kind of guided me as a as a filmmaker uh, has been uh, The Power of Myth uh, by Joseph Campbell and Bill Moyers. It was actually a PBS uh, special way back when. Uh, if, for those of you who aren't familiar with Bill Moyers, uh, he, I'm sorry, with um, Joseph Campbell, he, uh, he was the uh, anthropologist uh, that. Uh, guided the first Star Wars movies. So it was uh, he worked with George Lucas quite a bit to create the uh, the typical uh, hero's journey. Uh, and so he's written a number of different books. So if you're if you're more of a, a video learner, uh, you can watch them online uh, off YouTube uh, or you can uh, read the book. Uh, I personally I keep the book next to my bedside uh, because it just reminds me of if I'm stuck in a story, I'm trying to figure out what I want to do. You know, these are the archetypal stories uh, for uh, many, many civilizations. So it discusses uh, Native Americans, Indians, uh, cultures that have been around far longer than uh, us in the U.S. have been. Uh, and then the other book I would also recommend uh, is a, a photography book uh, called uh, The Photographer... So I'm, I'm blanking. It's a... Uh, Michael Freeman, uh, he's written a number of different books. Um, uh, the Photographer's Eye, uh, that's the book. Uh, so it's actually one of the first books that I read uh, when I was starting off as a photographer. Uh, Michael Freeman's The Photographer's Eye, and it gives you a, a great breakdown of how to uh, compose a, a photograph uh, and what makes a good photograph. Uh, and you can use those with, with your dashboard designs as well and, and guiding your users on how, uh, you know, where do you want them to look first, uh, where do you want them to look second, um, et cetera. So, yeah. Well, Raleigh, thanks for that. And uh, personally, you know, I've always enjoyed uh, Joseph Campbell, read him many years ago, and I also find him very valuable. Well, uh, Raleigh, thank you for those great answers to some very good questions. Uh, for those of you that asked questions that weren't answered today, we'll be sending all those unanswered questions to Raleigh and the Tableau team so they can follow up with you after today's webinar. Uh, I have just a, a few quick announcements. First of all, please mark your calendars for June 7th. That's our next Data Science Central webinar, which is the top five technical tricks to try when you're trapped, sponsored by Dell Statistica. Uh, also remember that today's taping will be available for on-demand viewing later today, uh, and you can find that on the homepage of Data Science Central in the webinar tab, tab located at the top of the page. Well, this brings our uh, webinar to a close. And I'd like to thank our audience for their attendance and thoughtful questions. And a special thanks again to Tableau for their sponsorship and our speaker today, Rawi Nanakul, for his insight into a very interesting topic. Uh, my name is Bill Voorhees. I'm very pleased to have been your host for today's event. And I look forward to seeing you all again on June 7th. Have a great day.